yesterday I asked for uh, suggestions on what to talk about today, which is a really effective way of coming up with some topic. We went out and had some dinner after the retreat yesterday, and I told the two monks they couldn't get out of the car until they gave me a suggestion. So we had talked about mindfulness yesterday, and so uh, that was a suggestion, but I'll, I, I periodically talk about that was our talk during our retreat yesterday. Donna didn't know that, but that was the case. So acceptance. It was suggested that uh, acceptance and did you say acceptance or where's yes. William? Is that what you said, acceptance? Yeah, that's what I said. Okay. All right, that's what I remembered. We just went through a, a really interesting time. And um, in my memory, I don't remember an election that ever, uh, nobody remembers an election like the election we just had. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's ever been an election like the election we just had. And uh, the feeling as I talk to people, and of course, we try to, most of the time, we try to stay clear of politics, you know, cause, because, uh, let's face it, when you ask somebody who are you going to vote for, uh, you, you usually are asking them, are you going to vote for who I'm going to vote for? <laughs> and uh, yeah, and if they go, oh, I, I really like Hillary, and that's who you like, then you go, oh, good, and you feel good. Because now you know that uh, somebody agrees with you that you're right. And I like to point out that most of the time people pick their friends because they agree with them on most things. Nobody agrees about everything. But why would you pick somebody that just thought you were wrong on everything you did? But sometimes if you're very, very strong, you pick a I looked looked you look sometimes you pick a friend that disagrees with you about things because it makes you a stronger person and it makes you examine what you believe. And that's a good thing. That's what education is about. Education is supposed to be about examining what you believe. Not finding out you're wrong. But it's also not finding out that you're you're right. It's just looking at what you believe and understanding what you believe and sometimes changing your mind because you look and you say, oh, well, I, I believe that. I say that all the time. I have beliefs from when I was young and I don't know why I believe that. I believed it so long that I can't tell you why I believe what I believe. So now it's time to go and look at that again and, and decide what I actually think about it, you know. And then maybe I come up with the same belief. Well, here we had this election. Well, the one thing we know about the election is that uh, I talked to many people and I would say to them, so what are you going to do? And, and I wasn't sure what I was going to do, vote, almost until the last minute. I really wasn't sure. And I had a great deal of difficulty. Some people would had very strong, Steve's not here. I wish Steve was here because... You know, Steve told me one time, and I used to joke, I'd say, oh, when Hillary becomes president, we'll do this. And then another time I'd say, when Donald becomes president, we'll do this. And I'd look for a reaction, because I was really trying to feel what people thought. And Steve one time said, oh, you can't vote for Trump. Trump doesn't like people. No. That's what he told me. He says, he doesn't like people. Yeah, Hillary likes people, but Trump doesn't like people. I went, oh, okay. Because I'm old enough now that I'm certainly not going to get in an argument about these things, you know. That's for young people to argue about politics. But I was very curious of what people thought. Because I'll tell you what I thought now. I thought both of them were not qualified to be president. I thought we were in a very, very bad place because we had nobody running who could be a, a, our ideal leader. 
a leader that would take us through hard and difficult times. I did not feel either one of them would do it. And so I felt that we had no choice. I, I would tell people, well, maybe just slip a coin and then vote for whoever is, you know, okay, heads it's Trump, tails it's, it's Hillary. Oh, it's tails, I'll vote for Hillary, and then it, it'll, we'll see what happens. So that was, a very, that was an unusual thing. It's very unusual. I remember one election, and the two people were debating, as these people did, and I was really for this one man. He was a hero in the Vietnam War. And for me, that was an important thing, that he had gone to Vietnam and fought for, you know. And so I was in favor of him. But then when he, in the debates, he acted like a small child. He complained. And I thought, do I want a leader that when things get difficult, he complains? And my answer had to be, no, I don't want a leader that complains. I want a leader that tries to fix the job, fix things. Okay, so that was what decided me on that one. You can figure out who that was that complained. But I was very disappointed in him because I thought he was a hero. And he has had a difficult life and here he is complaining. I don't like complainers unless it's me complaining. Then it's okay to complain. Okay. So I thought, okay, well, here's these two people, and I really don't, I, I'm not inspired to follow each one of, either one of them. Okay, so I have difficulty there. Then, then I watched a little bit of the debates, and I thought, all you do is say bad things about each other. That's all you do. And so I was discouraged even more. Because I thought, okay, you're supposed to set the good example. Isn't that what leaders are supposed to do? Set a good example. And yet, almost from the beginning, oh, you did this. Oh, you did that. And, and I could see, I tell people I could see, if I close my eyes, I could see Hillary with a big, big mouth going, Donald Trump doesn't like women. <laughs> And I could see Donald Trump going, don't you talk about me like that. But nobody said, what are we going to do about the war? Nobody said, how are we going to feed the hungry? Nobody said, okay, we have a program for insurance for health. Is it working? The question is, is it working? The question is, I don't like what Obama did. That's not a question. That's an opinion. The question is, are things working? If they're working, then everything's fine. If they're not working, let's fix it. I did not see leaders. Everything's over with. And a lady, friend of mine, she told me on the phone, I called her up about something and she said, they're rioting in all the cities against Trump. These people are in the streets are unhappy that they have Trump. And I thought, I don't ever remember people getting upset and rioting in the seats, streets because they did not get their way. See, because we have such an unusual thing in this country, it's called a democracy. And we get to pick who we want. And I want to tell you a secret. I know people on both sides, I know very liberal people that feel the government could, should do everything for a person from the time they're born till the time they die. That's what very liberal is. It's extreme. You should never have to worry about anything. We'll take care of it. And I watched a show on Denmark one time. And in Denmark, you go to the doctor whenever you're sick, no problem. You want to go to university, you go sign up and you go to university. It doesn't cost you anything. You... Uh, you get all of these things from the government, but your taxes are, I think, they're like 60 or 70 percent. They're huge. So you pay for it. It's not like you're on welfare. It's not that. It's you should give all your money to the government, and they say, okay, you can go to the doctor, you can go to school, okay, you can, you can take a vacation now, everything. And I think, okay, well, that's different than what we do. 
What we do is we pick who's going to be our leader for four years. And if we lose, he's still our leader for four years. I had a friend, very, very conservative friend, this turn this turning into nothing but a political talk. <laughs> when Yeah, there's an off button on that. When Mr. Bush, I loved Mr. Bush, the last Mr. Bush. He could not talk without making a mistake. But I thought he was a good man. He just should be quiet. He would start talking, and the next thing he'd say something silly, and people would get embarrassed. Oh, he did it again. Oh, but he had a good heart. And he tried, I think, in my opinion, this is all my opinion, I think he tried very hard. And I told a friend of mine one time, I said, I wish he wouldn't talk. Just do a job. Don't talk. And my friend said, oh, he's our commander-in-chief. Don't criticize him. And I, he, my friend was retired from the Air Force. And he was kind of a hero. He was in Vietnam a couple times, too, back during the Great War. <laughs> and, and I said, he's not my commander-in-chief, but he is my president, and I get to have an opinion. Oh, no. So then Mr. Obama got elected. <clears throat> well, my friend has a belief. He believes you're either a Republican or you're a communist. Now, I don't know if that... That means he, you can't be a Republican or a Democrat. You're a Republican or you're a communist. That's what my friend believes. So when Mr. Obama got elected, of course he's a Democrat. He's the most liberal president we've ever had. And I went to my friend and I said, how do you like your new commander-in-chief? He could not speak because now he didn't agree. So he's what we call a fair weather friend. When the weather is good, everything's okay. When the weather is not so good, we complain. We have a new president. The system works. It was predicted that there was a machine in this world. Because I've been, I've been reading a newspaper. I started taking a newspaper and read it every day. There was a prediction that there was a bunch of powerful people that would not, and they would, they even announced it. They even announced to the news that Hillary would win and that the American people would not pick the president, that Hillary, you know those guys, that summit, that G something or other summit that gets together, where all the business, the big money of the entire world decides what they're going to do? This guy spoke for them and said, we're backing Hillary and she's going to win. And you might as well not even worry about it because we have decided who the President of the United States is going to be. It's going to be Hillary Clinton. I am so glad that Donald Trump won to prove that these people could not control our government. If for no other reason they can't control the government. I read in the paper this morning that they have decided that Donald Trump, the people that elected him, were the middle class and the poor. Okay, I can go for that. So now all we have to do is wait. I think things will not be as bad as I thought they were going to be. I think we have to wait and see what's going to happen. But I think we have to accept. I went and voted. I hope everybody voted. The people that voted for Donald Trump won. The people that voted for Hillary won. We have a democratically elected president, and it doesn't matter whether you like him. For four years, he's going to do whatever he's going to do, or for four years, you're going to suffer. Because the Buddha could have written a serenity prayer. You probably don't know this. You know the serenity prayer? It's, you know what an alcoholic is? Somebody that can't stop drinking? They have a club, it's called Alcoholics Anonymous. And in Alcoholics Anonymous, they get together and they talk about the fact that they can't stop drinking, but they encourage each other to stop drinking. And it works. Not always, but it works a lot better than not having Alcoholics Anonymous. I, and if you, 
the people, see this is going to go on YouTube. So I've said this before, I come from an alcoholic family. I'm the only one in my family that's not an alcoholic. That does not make me special. That just means something happened when I was born, that's all it means. It doesn't mean I have lots of willpower, it just means I happen to be the only one that isn't. Everybody else is. And they all belong to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I joke with friends of mine I know that are alcoholics. I say, you know, when my family gets together, we have a meeting. Mm -hmm. And they stand up and say, my name is Stephen. I'm an alcoholic. My name is Brian. I'm an alcoholic. Because that's what they do in these meetings. And they encourage each other not to be, not to drink. And they have a prayer. And it's a wonderful prayer. And the Buddha, it's exactly what the Buddha taught. Let me change the things I can change. And let me accept the things I can't. And let me know the difference between the two. And as the Buddha was talking, was talking to us about attachment and desire, if I'm an alcoholic, I have an enormous desire not to be an alcoholic. I know lots of alcoholics and one of their desires is I wish I could take a drink and not have to take a second and a third and a fourth drink until I fall asleep because I drink so much. I don't know any alcoholic that wouldn't like to be able to have a couple beers and that stop. But they can't. Sometimes they pretend they can. I've known alcoholics that say, oh, in Canada they did a study. And they found out that, you know, once you got sober for so many years, you could go back and you could have a drink once in a while. I've watched them with my eyes. I personally know one man who believed that. And when he started drinking again, he just had one drink at night. Just one drink. He said, oh, I can have one drink. It's no problem. And then the next time I saw him, I can have two drinks. It's no problem. And the next time I saw him, he was drunk at my door. And I couldn't understand what he was saying because he was so drunk. So what we have to accept there is that this is our condition. I can't drink. Period. Even though it would be nice. See, I drink because they invented, I'm not an alcoholic. But monks aren't supposed to drink, right? But I love the taste of beer. And they have all these wonderful non-alcoholic beers now. And I always have a couple of them around. And Susan will tell you, I love O'Doul's. Okay, I love Coca-Cola and I love O'Doul's. And I'll drink a couple O'Doul's. And, and I love the taste of that. It's very strong, no alcohol. But that isn't what an alcoholic wants. They don't want to taste. I said to a friend of mine one time, I said, you want to know duels? Oh, no. Why not? Well, it doesn't have any alcohol. Oh, okay. Well, you, you understand why you don't want the old duels, because it's a strong tasting beer. So it must be that Chuck, I gave Chuck one time, he was over, I gave him a couple old duels, he started getting tipsy. I think his body remembered what it was to drink beer. He said, no, I better not have any more. I'm starting to feel that. <laughs> and I'll bet you his body said, you've been drinking beer. You should feel this way. It's very difficult to accept the things that we don't want to accept. There are people that don't have musical ability, and some of them it's very hard for them to accept they don't have musical ability. And so they, we have to listen to them when we have a party, you know. I grew up in a Japanese temple, and when somebody gets married, everybody goes to a big party, and everybody has to take turns singing. And the party's not over until everybody at the party sings. It's a very painful experience, <laughs> because some people can sing so beautifully, and some people sing so badly. But they don't. They have to sing a song. You know, today we were doing Om Mani Padme Hum, and I was listening to my monks over here, thinking, I got to get him to the side and work on him, or maybe have Susan's quite a singer. This lady here, she's sung for years. She's sung in choirs. She has a <coughs> wonderful voice. 
Maybe I could get Susan to work with him. You know, make a note. La. Now harmonize with that note. Any note, doesn't matter what it is. La. Just harmonize with it. And then just kind of do some ear training. You know who I'm talking about? Could you work on him for me? Yes, sir. I appreciate that. He doesn't have to accept the fact that he's not quite in with it. He just has to adjust. You know, that's all. But sometimes we have things we have to accept. It's just that simple. I'm looking. Vui Mung over there. He's well into middle age. Someday he'll be old. He's going to have to accept being old. Yeah. And he can't escape it. He's stuck. How do I get out of this hole? Well, we try so hard. We try. I go to a, I started taking yoga so I'd be healthy. Not so I'd be young, but so I'd be healthy. And I walk in there. I thought at our Tai Chi class, I do Tai Chi also because I, I, think, I think we need to do stuff. We need to move, stay healthy. In the Tai Chi class, we have old people. In the yoga class, oh my gosh, they're all really, really old. I'm in this class and I feel like if my grandma and my grandpa are in this class with me. They are so old and they're doing this. And in one sense, some of those people I know they're there because they don't want to get old. But I don't think many of them are there because they don't want to get old. I think they've accepted they're getting old. I think what they don't want to accept is stop doing things. That's what I think they're doing. They've accepted getting old. They will not accept sitting in front of a TV and getting ready to die. So they go twice a week to go to yoga class. Two or three times a week to go to Tai Chi. They have a good time. They move their body. I was so tired. Our yoga instructor, Friday, she kept us for an hour and a half. It's an hour class. I told Susan when I saw her yesterday, we had a little retreat here yesterday, meditation retreat. I told Susan, I said, I was so tired. I couldn't believe it, an hour and a half. And it was yoga for old people. And I was so tired at the end of that. I said, I feel like I've been out working all day. Accepting things are very difficult. Accepting our limitations are very difficult. Accepting old age is very difficult. Accepting illness is difficult. Accepting death is difficult. I sound just like the Buddha. So what can we do? My, my stepfather came up and spent a couple days with me last month. And we were talking. And uh, I said something about, boy, I've lost a lot of people this last couple of years. He says, I don't like it anymore. He says, this is not fun. Because you pick up the paper and so and so died, so and so died, so and so died, so and so died. But you just have to accept it. Now, you pick up the paper and it says, 12 year old girl dies, run over by car. You go, oh, that's so sad. But as Buddhists, we know 12 year old girl is going to come back anyway, if you believe in reincarnation. If you're a Buddhist that doesn't believe in reincarnation, then I don't know what you think. To me, I think, okay, if something happened to this little girl, some accident, it's not a happy time. We will pray for her and say, come back and you be our teacher. Because that's Buddhism. But I don't understand Christians that gets upset because the baby goes to heaven. So why are we upset? You know, but we're upset because of our loss. I know why we're upset. We're not upset because somebody suffers because they die. We're upset because we don't get to see them anymore. That's why we're upset. We're upset because we missed them. And if we really, if we love them a lot, if it's a mom or a dad or a brother or a sister or a child, then we've, we've, there's this void. There's something missing. Donna has come out. This is Donna right here. See this interesting lady here? She painted that picture a long time ago. She lives in Wisconsin. She came out to visit us uh, and is going to stay for a while here at the temple and do some, do some little statues of bodhisattvas and we're going to put them out around the property. 
and she she wrote me an email and she said I'm coming but I have to be able to Skype you know what Skype is you get on the com you know of course you know <laughs> yeah you get on the computer and you can talk to somebody and you see their picture well she has grandchildren and she says I cannot I cannot go any place where I cannot talk to my grandchildren well of course not of course she needs to talk to her grandchildren so she says I have to be able to get do you have Wi-Fi and I said no we don't have Wi-Fi but I found out a way to take care of that we haven't you haven't brought that up but if you talk to Marilyn she'll tell you how to do that where you can just do it for a month or two rather than having to sign a contract which is what we do out in California if you want to have internet you have to sign a contract so what happens if something happens to her grandchildren? It's very, very sad. It's very, very sad. We have to accept it, though, because we can't change it. If we grow old, we have to accept it because we can't change it. Women are treated like second-class citizens. Do we have to accept that? No, we don't have to accept that because we can change it. And even though things are not perfect today, they're a lot different than they were in 1950 when a woman could not own a house, could not have a credit card, had no personal identity, and belonged to her husband. So there are things we can change, and the thing is, go change them. Change the stuff you can change. But you better accept Donald, because we have him for four years. And I'm hoping... I'm hoping that he's going to surprise us and that we're going to have a lot of good things happen because I don't want to think about bad things happening. And if the bad things happen, I'll write him a letter and say, hey, this is not good. And I don't ever write letters to anybody, but I think I'd write our president a letter and say, okay, nobody's happy with what you're doing. Let's do things different. And at least I would get a letter back from him saying no. And I would put it in a frame and I'd hang it on the wall and say, look, I got a letter from the president. <laughs> Wouldn't that be neat? So the Buddha was about accepting. The Buddha was, knew he was going to die. We know the story of the death of the Buddha. The Buddha had terrible arthritis. The Buddha used to sit in meditation and enter samadhi, or as they say in Pali, the jhanas. And he would do that. He would tell Ananda, I'm going to meditate for a while because my arthritis hurts so bad. I just need a little break, a little relief. There was no ibuprofen. There was no medicine to take. So he would meditate for a, an hour or two, and his, he would stop feeling the pain. And then he would come back, and he would teach his students. And when he ate bad food and he got sick and he knew he was going to die, he gathered everybody around and he said, I'm dying. Are there any questions? Because <laughs> I'll be gone soon. And everybody said, oh, oh, oh. And he said, no, this is, this is life. This is what happens. You're born, you live, you die. And you must accept this. <coughs> you know, before you turn the camera off, would you turn the camera at that picture? Because I mention it every once in a while, and nobody on, on YouTube or wherever they're going to see this sees that picture. So the lady that painted this picture, for those of you on YouTube, that if you haven't picked your computer up yet, that's the lady that painted the picture. How many years ago, Donna? 10, 11. 11 years ago. And I really think this is the first time an American artist has painted a Buddhist picture. Uh, lots of people copy pictures from China, Japan, Vietnam. Laos, they copy pictures. But Donna, this was out of her heart. She did not copy anything. She painted this picture all by herself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
and we're done.